give you glory and honor and praise, and we thank you so much for all you're doing in us. We thank you, God, for being here with us. We thank you for bringing us here, and we ask you to watch over us, open our hearts and our minds and our ears to your word and all you would have to say to us. We give you glory and honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as you probably heard, uh, being a big mouth skips a generation, and my grandson has it. Um, so, uh, uh, anyway. Uh, but, you know, I was had this big, long teaching. You may remember when I came here last, and then we got interrupted. Um, and uh, I kind of lost it. I kind of lost the thread. I still have the teaching, but I just, it, it just kind of seemed like it withered up on me and everything. And I, the last few days, have been saying, Lord, what do you want me to do with this? And so on and so forth. And I didn't uh, have a lot of direction. And, and so I just said, well, I'm just going to not worry about it and trust you. And as I was sitting there, it kind of flooded into my heart and mind a lot of things that I hadn't thought before. Uh, about it, and uh, I've got another Bible here I may, may use, and and also being brought uh, uh, face to face with my uh, daughter I haven't seen for years, and my grandson, uh, we've had, my daughter and I have had some discussions, uh, including my wife, you know, about, about stuff, and it's kind of crystallized around this story, uh, this teaching. And one of the things that I was thinking about was, uh, and, and another thing happened, was that we got a Kenneth Copeland news, uh, you know, letter that was exactly on the same subject. From a different angle, but the exact same subject. And I read that, oh man, that is really timely. But, <clears throat> What occurred to me for the first time, and it's, it's not a huge revelation, but what occurred to me for the first time when I was sitting there was that when we come to the Lord, regardless of our age, uh, we're babies. I don't care if you come when you're 90, you're a baby, okay? And you're lost and bereft and you have nothing, okay? And you become born again, okay, and 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 therefore you are a baby. Okay. And to grow into maturity, some things have to be moved out of your way, and so then you get water baptized. And water baptism, when you understand it properly and are immersed properly, understanding it and receive it by faith as you did salvation, you are buried with Jesus Christ, and your old man dies. And you're resurrected to a new person. Now the way is open for you to mature. But the first part is free. The second part is free. You didn't really do anything. Okay, except chose to believe. And then the next step in salvation, which Jesus lays out for Nicodemus, is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Where again, by faith, you receive the gift from God, and Jesus says, and with this gift, I give you the power to overcome all the works of the enemy. Right? That's what he told them when he said he was in the Holy Spirit. Well, now you, now you see, there's a lot of implication there. Okay? There's a lot of, there's a lot there. Okay? In that little phrase, and with him, I give you power over all the works of the enemy. That's, that's huge. Okay. And you know what else it marks? It marks the first thing that is clearly implied to you in this process where, okay, you got free, you got free, you got free. Now it's on you. You understand? You got saved by just choosing to believe. Didn't cost you anything. You got water baptized by choosing to believe. It didn't cost you anything. You got the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the ability to pray in tongues, the perfect prayer. 
and authority and power it didn't cost you anything. But now it's on you. Because God doesn't want a bunch of babies, does he? What does God want? What does God want you to be? Well, I am sure of the word of God. Christ Christ. Sure, sure. What else? What does he want you to be? Why did he give you that Holy Spirit? Okay. And if you're going to fight the enemy, you need to be a what? A warrior. Prayer too, but a warrior. Okay? Okay. I don't believe that you know, people that say they're prayer warriors that are not warriors all the rest of the time too. Okay? If all, if you claim all of your warfare is when you're alone somewhere on your knees or whatever like that, I have to question the powerfulness of your warrior. Because you know, a warrior is a person that's a warrior all the time, okay? A warrior is a person that carries that around. A warrior, if you ever been around warriors, when they come in the room, you can identify them. You never saw them before in your life, and you go, that's somebody you don't need to mess with. God wants you to be a warrior. That doesn't mean you're rude and you know, nasty to strangers or anything like that, but he wants you to be a warrior, okay? And more than being a warrior, he makes promises to a certain class of people throughout the Bible and especially in Revelation over and over and over again. He says, not just of warriors in general, but of a certain class class of people which he gives a name that they will be the ones that receive the promise and they are called Overcome. overcomers that's exactly right an overcomer is a warrior who has not only practiced but gone to battle many times okay now one of the, and I, I know I've mentioned this before, but one of the greatest things God did for me, because I came out of, you know, a completely irreligious background, was when I got first got saved, I felt God wanted me to, and even though I probably thought it was my bright idea, but I thought, felt like I should read all the biographies and autobiographies of all the great spiritual leaders I could find in history. From way back, Fenelon and Madame Guillaume to Pat Robertson. I read about, you know, all kinds of these guys, okay, Finney and, and you know, Whitfield and, and just all of them, from all over the world, missionaries, tons of missionaries. I couldn't even begin to remember, uh, remember all the names of these people. And, and this served a, a lot of great purposes in my life, okay, because I'm going to tell you something, and this may apply to nobody here but it applies to a lot of people that are Christians that are out there in the world. If you were raised up in a church, you're getting one perspective. Okay? You raised up in one church, you're getting one perspective. Here's what they think about everything, and you go, well, that's what we think about everything. Okay? And, and nobody in this church has ever done anything like that, so that probably isn't okay. What's well, normal, right? That's what you're raised in. It's like being raised in a family, right? You think your family does everything the way every family's supposed to do it, then you go to another family and you find they have a whole different, you know, deal, you know? Um, uh, and, but the fact of the matter is when you read all these different biographies, you see all these different men and how they had different approaches and different ideas. And different, but then you also see these, what I call golden threads, running through the, of the things that God really emphasized to them, okay? Where is he got? God made a real strong point of that with him and him and her and him and her, okay? And all this other extraneous stuff, stuff that a lot of very religious people can get hung, hung up on, God really didn't seem to be too concerned with it. Uh, one of the great English uh, evangelists, I can't remember his name right now, Smoked cigars all his life. 
okay? Now, you know, right, right now, if you saw some famous minister smoking a cigar, there are tons of people in the church who just come unglued about that, you know? Because, oh my God, he must not be saved. Well, you're crazy if you think somebody can't be. I mean, I'm not saying smoking a cigar is a good idea. It's a horrible idea, okay? And, and, and especially for the people around you. <laughs> but, but the fact of the matter is, if you're going to get hung up on something that's silly, <laughs> you are missing. Okay? Peter Cartwright was a famous traveling cowboy evangelist. Okay? And drunken cowboys come into his meetings, he'd go down and beat the snot out of them. Not saying we should do that in the church, but I'm saying God, he got thousands and thousands and thousands of people saved. Okay, and he was a hard man. Okay, but God moved in power around him, and great things happened. Somehow, God just didn't get that hung up on his issue. And and when you read all these biographies, you see all kinds of issues with these people. All kinds of them. Okay, the great unbelievable Catherine Kuhlman during the Hiram ministry, was in an adulterous relationship for five years, and yet the miracles kept happening. Again, adultery, not good, okay? I, she was miserable. She said in her biography how horrible that time of her life was. But for some reason, because the gifts and calling of God are not never taken back, God kept using her mightily. And there were people outside that judged her. Oh, she's going to hell, blah, 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 blah. None of their business. Okay? She kept fighting through and became stronger and more anointed by going through. Now, here's the thing that I want you to see with all these people and all these experiences and everything in your life. And that is this. And you already introduced this, by the way, which is, it, is that God, there's only one way there's only one way that God can make you an overcomer, okay? And that is, you have to overcome stuff. <laughs> Dang it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, there's no shortcuts. Sorry, okay? And thankfully, I read all that before we had kids. And, and one of the things I noticed in all of these biographies and autobiographies and all the great testimonies of my contemporaries at the time you know, uh, 40, 50 years ago, was how the vast majority of these people with great anointings and callings had come out of really hard circumstances. Okay? And they got saved, and they saw the value of Jesus Christ, and they repented, which is required if you expect anything from God ever, repentance, it should be a regular thing. Okay? And, and they overcame. They came out of and I saw how few that came out of a Christian home had any efficacy in the church of God. They had religion. They knew what to say. They knew what to do. They were good people, perhaps. But they had very little power and very little authority because they never overcame anything. These are lessons I learned before we ever had kids. And I knew, I'd seen them, I'd seen plenty of pastor's kids and Christian kids and everything. I thought, you know what? We're going to throw hurdles in front of our kids immediately. It is not going to be easy for them. We're going to push them in every way. And, and we did. We threw hurdles over them all the time. We constantly pushed them, scholastically, physically, in every way. You can be better. Work, fight, overcome. Okay? And because I knew, I had even friends, personal friends that I was raised with that didn't have any obstacles in front of them and saw what they became. Okay? And so we, we're, we're just not going to do that. Now, I didn't do it perfectly, my wife didn't do it perfectly. But God caused it to work together for good. And you need to understand how essential it is that you choose the
the tougher path sometimes. And that especially if you're a parent or a grandparent, that you choose the tougher path because your children and grandchildren and the people that come into your church are never going to be any good at all if they don't learn to overcome. Because, according to my Bible, and you can check and see if yours say something different, things are just going to get tougher and tougher. And only those that overcome are going to receive all that God has for them. Okay. One of the, you know, the, the, the book that was spoken of earlier is one that I realized and because, because I was in an absolute <coughs> abyss of despair and hopelessness. And the principles in that book brought me out. And when I say an absolute abyss of hopelessness and despair, I mean uh, all I thought about was killing myself. And I employed the principles in that book that she's going to talk about. And, and once I did, when I started discipling people, those Three of the books by that same author were required for every person that I discipled. Power and Praise, Answers to Praise, and Praise Works. Prison of Praise is a great book, too. I, I recommend it. Uh, and my children actually have given away lots of copies of that because they think it speaks to young people uh, as well or better than the other ones. But, but I think for people that have a Christian background and have a walk with the Lord, that, that's kind of it's, it's the, this one and the other two that are really essential. But the fact of the matter is, is that you cannot be an overcomer unless you are, just like with the first three free gifts, willing to go through them. You have to be willing to be saved and choose to believe. You have to be willing to be baptized and choose to believe. You have to be willing to to be trained to be an overcomer and choose to believe that your Heavenly Father is watching over you and believe in Him and trust Him. Amen. You have to choose to believe. Okay? And, you know, it's like when, when I got married, the Lord had spoken to my wife and, and she, and I know I've mentioned this, she came to me and goes, you know, God showed me these different people in the Bible and said that, you know, right when they got married, they went into the wilderness. You know, that their, their marriage and the wilderness experience, some kind of testing and trial happened right together. And she said, I think God showed me that for you. I'm like, oh, good. <laughs> uh, God says, here, marry this girl you hardly know, and guess what now? <laughs> and, and, but, you know, the thing is, I knew he... I knew God provided me with somebody to help me get through it. And, you know, God sent me to see a very famous man, which some I know a lot of you have heard his name. His name is Bob Mumford. He's a world-famous minister. God sent me to see him. And uh, he didn't know. Bob Mumford didn't know. Uh, and, uh, but God said, he's down in Springfield, Missouri. Go see him. And I'm like, oh, okay. And uh, so... Uh, Kim and I packed up and we took off. We knew uh, some people that were uh, um, assistant pastors in that church. And uh, we went there and I said, well, you know, we're actually here because God told me to come see Bob Mumford. And they said, oh, really? And I said, yeah. He goes, does he know? I go, no, he does not. <laughs> and uh, I said, so if you could just get him on the phone with me, we'll see if I have a clue or not. And I, they they got him on the phone, and he was somewhere else, obviously, and I got him on the phone, and I said, well, I said, I know you don't know who I am, but God told me to come and see you, and I realized that I have no, you know, uh, right or anything to tell you to see, but, um, you know, I'm just doing what I feel like God told me to do, and really, that's all. And he goes, well, he goes, I thank you very much for your attitude, and he goes, he goes, there's pretty much no chance he is that I have my schedule absolutely packed. And he goes, I, I do not have any free time. And so, uh, you know, uh, I just let you know that 
there's no way we can see each other. And I said, okay, fine. And I uh, hung up the phone. I said, okay, I've done what I felt like I should do. About 10 minutes later, the phone rings. <laughs> Bob Mumford says, I don't know who you are, but God really, really wants me to see you. <laughs> and, and did we see him like three times? Or? During that meeting? No, 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 during the time we were down there. He, he made time for us to see him repeatedly. But um, anyway, uh, and it's like the, one of the first things he said to me was, God showed me that your wife is your shock absorber which I thought was perfect, okay? Uh, and, and, but the fact of the matter is, is that God knew that for me to do the things I needed to do, I had to be tried and tested. I had to go through rough things. I had to mess up. I had to stop taking responsibilities for things that I couldn't control. I had to quit condemning myself for everything anybody did that I had any influence, whatever. I had to quit blaming myself for rainy days. I mean, it was almost that bad. It was just ridiculous, okay? And my wife was there as my shock absorber. But the thing is, I had to go through that to get better and to learn to be an overcomer. And I'm not telling you I've arrived. Don't misunderstand me, okay? I'm not Mr. Overcomer here, but I am learning, okay? And, um, and few people know the things that I have overcome because what's the point? Uh, and you, although you've heard smatterings, but the fact of the matter is, is that it doesn't really matter what it is because God loves you and he is your father and he is your training officer. He is your drill sergeant. He is the one that wants to teach you to overcome and he knows what you can take. Okay. And he knows what you need. And you have to volunteer. You have to say, I want to be an overcomer, Lord. I want to be pleasing to you, whatever it takes. Okay? And, and one of the things I said when I was a baby Christian, and I was reading all these biographies and everything like that, I said, God, I want to do your will. I want to be pleasing to you. I said, I do not want to step out of bounds. I do not want to do wrong. I said, and I said this over and over in my prayers, even if you have to run over me with a semi-truck and make me a quadriplegic to get my attention, you have my permission to do that. Now, I realize that that's kind of extreme and silly, but I was very young, and I, I was expressing my heart, okay? The fact of the matter is you need to look at the disciples and how their lives ended and you need to look at a whole lot of people that have served God in mighty ways and the things they've been through the loss, the deprivation the loneliness and everything like that and you need to go, you know what whatever God wants because this time here on earth is nothing it's nothing there's nothing to fear here, there's nothing to worry about you know, we let the cares of the world, and I, I, will, I will be surprised if anybody in this room has been more consumed by the cares of the world than I have, which is one of the reasons I had to be dealt with, okay? But, but the fact of the matter is, we lose our divine, holy, eternal perspective because we get distracted by this, okay? And God does not want you to be that way because... Because you have an eternity with him. And what he wants to make you, you will be in that eternity. Now, I don't know. I, God hasn't given me anything past what's in here. And I'm sure there's a ton in here I don't fully grasp. Um. And whether you know it or not, you should be comforted by the fact that you've got somebody teaching you that admits he's ignorant. The guys who are sure about everything in here, they're the ones you need to worry about, okay? <laughs> they're the ones that make up answers that they don't, everybody doesn't have, okay? But the fact of the matter is, we don't understand everything. It's a constant revelation. Every time you read the Word, every time you see God, 
It's a revelation. Okay? How much he loves you is something that will continue to deepen and be revealed to you. How much you are able to love will continually deepen and amaze you. Okay? I was, I was a hard, embittered, unloving person when I came to the Lord. And when I felt the Lord changing me and giving me love for people I didn't know, and then giving me love for people who hated me, it was amazing. Because I didn't even love me. I hated my own guts. Okay? And God started changing me and, and softening me. And, and that's because he was making me like Christ. And isn't it amazing and confusing to our minds? That as we grow and we mature and we become more and more powerful, that we become softer and more loving. Yeah. It's amazing. It's contradictory. Mm -hmm. Okay? My wife is absolutely one of the most gentle, loving, adorable people you will ever meet. Amen. It's the absolute yeah. truth. Everybody knows her and a great cook, which helps. But anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, years ago, in order to appease some misguided people, we went down to a, uh, a place that taught deliverance. Even though we'd been deliver ministering deliverance for well over a decade. And, and they're sitting there teaching this stuff, rudimentary stuff about deliverance and everything like that. And, uh, uh, and they said, you know, you need to be strong and you need to realize your authority and you need to stand up and you need to tell the devil to get out of your life and everything like that. And so they were doing like a little role playing thing. And the, and the teacher said, okay, well, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come over here and I'm going to pretend I'm the devil. And there's like six or eight tables with uh, cup people there. And she said, I'm going to go, I'm going to pretend I'm the devil and I'm going to say something to you and then you rebuke me. And so she goes to the table and, she goes, and they go, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. And now, you got to remember, we've been delivering ministry and deliverance for a long time, okay? And, and then she came over to our table and she goes, and, and I'm, I go like this. And before I can get the first word out of my mouth, Kim goes, in the name of Jesus, I command you to come and that woman goes, and her husband jumps. <laughs> and she goes, <laughs> and she goes, I think you've got it. <laughs> and, and, and of course, we also know what to say. We're not just, you know, because we've done this a lot. And so afterwards, they, they say, could, could we see you two in our office? <laughs> And they go, we're not sure you need this course. <laughs> you might want to come and help us teach. Would you like to come and help us teach? <laughs> and, and I'm not I'm serious. And so, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, and then they call the people who had asked us to go there that we did just because they had listened to nonsense and, and everything. And they said, these, you know, the people you sent us, absolutely understand deliverance and know how to do it right. Anyway, and, and uh, but the fact of the matter is, uh, and I told you about that June bug thing, right? Where she commanded the June bug to die and it dropped dead. <laughs> she was painting and it kept getting her to paint. You know, and, and going, you know, she said, yeah, Kim, yeah. Okay, so you see, even though she is sweet and gentle and loving, she's a warrior. Okay. She is tough, okay? She does, and, and you know, and my kids can tell you she's tough too. She is absolutely tough as nails, okay? And these two things, which may seem to a logical mind, you know, uh, to be very different opposing things are not, okay? As God turns you in to the overcomer he wants you to be, Okay, he also will soften you and make you more like Jesus. Jesus was a gentle, loving, caring person until you crossed him. Okay, you know, 
you know, the world is full of these pictures of Jesus holding a lamb and looking like an emo person, right? <laughs> okay? You know, there's, you know, me, if I'm going to have a picture of Jesus on the wall, I want where he's got the whip. Okay? You know what I'm saying? Okay? Because he didn't call me to snuggle lambs and look pathetic. He called me to be a warrior because our warfare is not against flesh and blood. Our warfare is against demonic powers. Everything going on in this world today that we see is so foul and vile and horrible is from demonic powers. I, I, I'm human. There are people out there that I see in the public, in the public life, and read about in newspapers and stories and things, and, and my brain goes, somebody needs to shoot them. That, because that's where I came from and because that just makes sense. But, you know, God still loves them. And their problem is from a demonic origin. Now, some of them are going to get shot. And, and, and maybe a lot of them need to be. But the fact of the matter is, I'm still supposed to love them. Okay? As horrible and vile as a lot of things they do are, I'm supposed to love them. Okay, because they were taken captive by demonic forces. And only God can look in their heart and say whether or not they want to be captive or they want to be free. Only God. That's not up to me. Okay, and so, so God wants me to be able to love them, which is a lot tougher than shooting them. But as you get more mature in Christ, and as you get more softened, and as you become more of an overcomer, and as you realize the power and authority you have in prayer, it gets easier and easier and easier. Okay? But you can't have that until you've overcome. It is why you need teach kids and teach uh, um, those that allow you to minister in their lives to overcome. You know, like this book, you may know Christians that go to their church, churches that constantly struggle. And you really are not in a position to teach them, to mentor them, uh, you know, to, uh, uh, you know, give them direction in their life and expect them to receive it. But thank God he's, he's created books like this where if you can just talk him into reading it, it might go beep, and they'll start, okay? It, you know, uh, Heather uh, and uh, another girl that was very, very much like Heather were two of the best people I ever disciple because they were people where I would say, you need to do this, and they would go, Okay, I didn't really have to debate with them, okay, although Heather more than Maria by a fair margin. I didn't have to, I didn't have to debate with them, basically. If I said it, they'd do it, okay? And, and, and as they did what I said and then saw the results, they, the, the argument got less and less and less and less, right? They go, yeah, well, that's clearly that's right, okay? And, and the, the fact of the matter is, is that God knows who you are, and he knows the resistance. He knows, for instance, if you say, God, I want to be an overcomer, and some tough times come in your life, that you're probably going to whine. You're probably going to go, why me? Whatever like that. But you know what? He, he gets that. It's not okay, but he gets it. And then you can repent of that, and then you can say, okay, praise the Lord. I'm going to overcome. <clears throat> In 2 Corinthians 5.10, it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one of us may receive what is due to us for the things done in the body, whether good or bad. Now, how are you going to do the good 
if you can't overcome? What is your consistent obstacle all of your life? Demonic power. You and everybody else. If there were no demons, doing the right thing would be like falling off a log. Okay? If you know, if you didn't have demons whispering suggestions in your head to do wrong things, you know, and, and justifying them and glorifying them and making them attractive, you wouldn't do them. Because if there were no demons, it would all be unthinkable and reprehensible. Okay, if there are no demons, this would be, you know, halfway between here and heaven. But the fact of the matter is, there are demons. And if, and does anybody have 2 Corinthians 5.10 open? Yeah. Okay, could you read 11? This is a amplified. Good. Therefore, since we know the fear of the Lord and understand the importance of the obedience and worship, we persuade people to be reconciled to him. But we are plainly known to God. He knows us everything about us. Okay, in that first line, it says the fear of the Lord. That word is actually terror. Okay, terror of the Lord. Okay, the, it is really important that we realize that God does know everything about us, and he has not abandoned us, okay? And that when we encounter difficulties, we take those as opportunities to overcome, okay? Uh, you know, and... Don't give up because you didn't do it perfect because if you could do it perfect, it wasn't really much of an obstacle, was it? Okay? You know, that's, that's one of the things that we learned with our kids, too, was that this might be an obstacle for one of them. The next one, the first one before that one, or the one after that one, might sail right over so we had to make their obstacle different, tougher, in a different area, okay? You know, like for Clayton, who's not here, scholastics was no obstacle. So we had to bring up the pressure in other areas, okay? Um, and, and insist on his effort, okay? Judo was really tough for Clay. He was not gifted at all, very uncoordinated. So... I told him, I said, you know, if we could only afford to have one kid in judo, you would be the one. Not the ones that are in here winning everything. Because he needed trials. He needed tough things in his life. Because the scholastics was just nothing. You know, when you, when you teach a four-year-old to play chess, and, and in a few weeks... He's playing against adults from the other room while he plays with his toys and calling in the moves and beating them. That's, that's a potential problem, child, right there. <laughs> and, 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 and so, you know, that wasn't going to get it done, right? We, we had, there had to be other obstacles. And he put plenty of them in his path because he listened to bright ideas that were offered to him by demonic uh, forces. So... He got lots of spankings. But God wants us to understand that we have to face these things and we have to fight them. God, in, in Revelation, uh, God, you know, speaks to the seven churches. And he says to these churches five different times, at least. Some translations have seven. But he tells them to repent. Okay. Repentance and overcoming are absolutely linked together. Okay. You can't just think you're going to overcome things when you have dirty laundry and things clinging on to you that need to be repented of. It is absolutely essential that repentance be a regular part of our life. And repentance implies something else that's very, very important. Humility. Okay. One of the things that 
I had to do a lot, and I realized there was no way out of it. Uh, and to stay, stay pleasing to the Lord was to repent before my children when I misbehaved concerning them or in front of them or anything to do with them. I had to go to them and tell them I was sorry. Okay, and I did it a lot <laughs> because I screwed up a lot. Okay, but see, that's the great thing about God. He doesn't really want me perfect. He wants me to overcome. And he uses my imperfections and the things in my life to help me overcome. Okay, he doesn't want me to be my children's buddies, friends. He doesn't want me to con be concerned with whether or not they like me. Can you imagine what kind of a discipler I would have been to Heather or Maria or anybody else if I was concerned with them liking me? It's mutually exclusive. I mean, it's absolutely mutually exclusive. If to whatever degree you're concerned about your children liking you, you're going to be a lousy parent. To whatever degree you decide that, that you want your congregation to like you, you're not going to be a good pastor, okay? If, if you're a boss of a company and you want your people to like you, if that, it, what, to whatever degree that is your goal, you are going to mess up your company. Now, if they like you because of your character, because you stick to the truth and you stand up for what's right and everything like that, the people that like you anyway are going to be the people of quality. Here's the difference between the people in the country, company. The people with character in the company are going to recognize that character and they're going to respect that character. Children aren't that way. Children will become the people that respect character and see character if they're raised with parents that are not concerned with themselves being liked and are only concerned with what kind of people they're turning out. God wants you to understand that that's how he looks at you, too. He loves you. He tells you he loves you all the time. He adores you. But you notice how he doesn't swoop down and hold you in your arms every time you whine about something? Have you noticed how he doesn't make every bad thing in your life disappear right away? Have you noticed that? Because he wants you to believe he loves you because he said so. He wants you to come to him and be saved because he said you could. And you choose to believe. He wants you to get water baptized and have your old man buried because he said so. And you choose to believe. He wants you to be baptized in the Holy Spirit because he said so. You should believe he loves you because he said so. Not because he gives you emotional comfort all the time. And, and you know, there are, there are a lot of people that I've met in the church who are constantly seeking emotional comfort. They are like leeches in the church. They're always looking for somebody to give them comfort in the church. And they want to pour out their problems and everything like that. And you, you never, ever, ever, ever get to the bottom of them. They never get better. They never fix, okay, because they... Are, they want to be comforted emotionally and mentally and, and everything and not trust God. Okay? And to a lot of pastors, that's all they're concerned with is making sure people will like them and their church will be like one of these in Revelation. It will be devoid of power because you cannot have a bunch of babies and expect them to be manifesting power. Okay? God wants to make you an overcomer. His entire design was to make you an overcomer. Okay? Everything he did, sending his son and then the Holy Spirit to fill you with power over every evil spirit on the planet. And this isn't a new concept that just came with Jesus, okay, either. Because in the Old Testament, God makes promises to Abraham, okay. He makes promises to all kinds of people, 
He uses his prophets to prophesy tremendous world-changing things. He's saying, I am the source, and through me, and by my word, and what I give you, you can overcome. But then it became a promise to everyone that comes to him through Jesus. And yet, how, how much do we see of it? Okay. Again. I am not setting myself up here as some kind of great example. Okay. I haven't walked on the water. Okay. I haven't raised anybody from the dead. Okay. <coughs> I got stuff to do and ways to go. But what you, what I'm trying to get across to you is that there is nobody here of any age that God cannot use if you will just ask and keep on asking. Keep on inviting him into the things you do. Keep on expecting him to be there. Ask him to show you what to do, and that will open the doors. That will make the, the, the way for things, that God will use you. And understand who you are. One of the greatest ways to get that through to people is for them to move in to praise and worship to where they understand this very simple thing. The devil and his demons cannot stand to be in the presence of real praise and worship. Amen. There are a lot of people who don't even realize that they got deliverance because they entered deeply into praise and worship and had coughing fits and so forth, and demons left them because they embraced praise and worship like never before. Okay? Now, that's the hard way to do it, that's, but you can do it. Okay? The fact of the matter is, is that when Jesus let Peter come out of the boat, His mind and his heart and his faith were invested in the fact that his Savior, that he saw him doing, walking on the water, and his Savior told him, he didn't even know he was his Savior at the time, but the Lord told him that he could walk on the water. Now, a lot of people would have you believe that Peter began to sink because he took up his eyes off Jesus. But I don't really think that's true. I believe Peter started to sink because he put his mind on the storm. I don't think <coughs> Jesus disappeared. I think Jesus was right there in front of him. I don't think he needed to look at Jesus. I think if he would have kept his mind on what his Lord said and what he was doing, he could have turned his back and walked all the way to the shore. But he let his mind get on the problem and overwhelm what he had just done, what he had just been told, and what he could see in front of his eyes. Right? Yes. But he let his mind, because I guarantee you, there was other people there going, you're going to say, you're going to die, look at that star, oh my God. Betcha. And so because he fell into that, it dragged him down. And he could have said, like my wife, in the name of Jesus. Lord, devil's giving me a hard time. I'll see it short. Yeah, he could have. Yeah, he could have. He absolutely could have. Because he understood. He let go of that understanding, but he understood. The fact of the matter is, it's the devil's job description, if you will, to talk you out of what you know and what you understand. To convince you of things that aren't true. That's what he does. He's the father of lies. He will lie about anything and everything. He will tell you, you can't. It's too hard. It's too far. Oh, I can't bear this. You know, man, 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 man. Okay? And if you respond with, hallelujah, thank you, God, I praise you. 
Okay? And that's one of the things you're going to learn in this book that's absolutely invaluable. And it's something that, believe it or not, a lot of those wimpy pastors in those wimpy churches who never do anything for God, they're no power flows, they actually, a bunch of them, argued against these books because they said when you praise God for the problem you're in, you're actually blaming God. Oh, no, you're not. You're not, you're not, if, if you praise God for whatever trial you're in, it, disease, you know, turmoil, family problem, whatever it is, you're not blaming God for it. What you are doing is taking that problem, ripping out of the one who, the hands of the one who caused it, and placing it into the hands of God. You're saying, oh, here I am in this mess, and I praise you, Heavenly Father, for this mess, because you work all things together for the good. You're taking that thing and ripping it from the hands of the author, even if you're the author, and you're handing it over to your Heavenly Father. Now, now we can see stuff happen. Yes. Okay? And then everyone's going to go, oh, no, no, but, but, but this is all your fault. This is all God's fault. This is why God must not love you. Blah, 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 blah. And you praise you. Thank you, Lord God. I give you glory and honor and praise. Look, things have happened in my life. I do not fully understand. I do not fully understand why God allowed our foster daughter to be taken away. The mother of that girl three times went to lawyers and tried to get us to adopt her. And God said no every time. And then at a certain age, about 11 years old, the mother just went off the deep end and came and got a daughter. And it was hell. I still don't understand it. I got some understanding after we had our had some of our kids and they started growing. My wife said, she goes, you know, I love Abaya. I love her so much. But I'm so glad she's not in this house with our kids because I can't imagine that being a good thing in their lives because she was very troubled because of her parents were saying. But the fact of the matter is, I, I, okay, I see that. I get that. Okay. And maybe she just wasn't willing to change enough. But it looked to us like she was really changed. But I don't know. But I don't fully understand that. But good news. I don't have to. I just have to praise the Lord. Okay? I, I you know, I, I don't understand why my dad, who seemed to resist the gospel far more than my mother, seemed to come around before he died. But my mother did not seem to come around. I don't understand that. But you know what? God loves them too. Whatever. I, it's, I'm not concerned about it anymore. It's not my problem. Okay? I mean, I pay, occasionally pray for both of them because the Bible clearly says pray for the dead. So occasionally I do. Okay? But, you know, and I'm not even sure how that works. <laughs> All I can think of is that, you know, they're in a place where maybe they can still hear the truth some. I don't know. Not my job. Okay? The fact of the matter is is that God is a loving God. He's always loving. He's always good. And he wants everyone made in his image to spend eternity in heaven with him. And if there's any possible way that they are willing to repent now, and I assume for some time after they die, God will make way. I think that's one of the reasons why people kind of go into a coma state a lot of times. And it takes hours or days for them to pass on. I have a feeling a lot of those people are getting their eyes open to a lot of things so they can make a choice. I could be wrong. I have been once or twice. Um, uh, uh, but the fact of the matter is, there's tons of stuff we don't know. And so don't allow the devil to inject into your mind the worst possible, uh, uh, you know, interpretation of what you're going through. D don't do that. You know, when you're, when you're going through something, don't, don't allow the devil to, to inject into your mind that this is terrible, this is unbelievable, God must not love me, blah, 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 blah. Instead, take that thing, rip it out of the hands of the devil, and take it to the Lord in praise and worship, and thank him. 
Because my Bible says all things, God will work all things together for my good. Okay, now why would God have said that if that did not specifically include bad things? Really? Because, I mean, obviously the very phrasing of that line indicates he wasn't talking about the great things in your life, right? He's talking about the tough things. Okay, and if we add our faith, believing God, and our standing in faith on the water, believing God by praising and worshiping Him, we won't sink and we won't lose grasp of that. Peter, as I said, could have said, I don't believe you, devil, you're a liar. Praise you, God. Hallelujah, Lord. I'll meet you on the shore. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. And he could have walked all the way to the shore. Miles. But he let the devil talk him out. Perfectly normal. Perfectly understandable. He let the devil give him fear later. God understands our weakness. He loves us anyway, but he wants you to know. And this is really, really important. Because people are always talking about God understands our weakness. Yes, he does. But he does not want you to stay weak. Okay. Yes, he understands your weakness. Yes, but he does not want you to stay weak. He wants you to get strong in him. Okay? And there is nothing, nothing that can stop you from getting strong in him except your unwillingness to let him deal with you, change you, teach you, grow you, and mature you in him. Okay? It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how, how much education you have or haven't had. It doesn't matter how tall you are, short you are. Doesn't, nothing, nothing matters. Because God is the same God to all of us. Except for the fact that he knows what we need individually and he will supply that. So ask him, trust him, believe him. One of the things, as you I'm sure remember when I first came here, that I emphasized over and over in many teachings was the fact that you need to invite God into everything you do. You need to start training yourself to hear his voice and be led by his spirit, okay? And the reason for that was I wanted to convince you how much God cared about every little thing in your life. Because if you get that, remember, remember how many of you remember the yogurt story about my daughter? The, where she wanted yogurts and she prayed and got the cake, okay? If I can get into your head that God cared so much about her that when she, being really broke at the time, really wanted some yogurt, and God extraordinarily supplied her with yogurt that was almost free of the most premium yogurts, a whole bunch of them, and you realize that that same God is the one who loves you, and that he cares that much about something that trivial, think, think. How that applies in your life. Think about all the things he cares about in your life. Every little thing. And the things that you could ask him. Because I'll bet you, of all the things in your life, you'd probably have to go way past the top 100 before you got to yogurt. <laughs> right? Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you'd be way, way in the triple digits, uh, you know. Uh, and, and oh yeah, and yogurt. He, but the thing is, he cares about those things. And he wants you talking to him and communicating with him because when you do, the more you do, the more he starts to answer. And the more he starts to answer, the more you start to realize, hey, the God <coughs> of the universe, the creator of heavens and earth, my God, my Lord, my King cares so much about me that he's answering me and meeting me and telling me all these things. There's one lady, she's not here tonight. I, I'm so bad with things. But she, she came up to me after I talked this one time, and she goes, well, I went to the store, and I prayed, and I asked God, you know, to be with me at the store and everything. She goes, I went to the store, and she goes, I'm buying stuff. I'm going to make potato salad. She said, I felt like the Lord said, go get some mayonnaise. And she went, no, I've got mayonnaise in the pantry. I don't need mayonnaise. And so she ignored it. 
She went home. Guess what? There's no mayonnaise. <laughs> and I said, that's so great. She kind of looked at me like, is that really short lady? Really, really oh, short. Judy? Judy, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, I, and I said, well, praise God, Judy. I said, that's so great. She, she's like, and I said, you heard him. It doesn't matter that you missed it. You heard him. He told you something so mundane because he cared about you. And now you know he'll be with you on every shopping trip you invited. Okay? The God of all creation cares about whether or not you have mayonnaise. That's crazy. It's true, though. And if he cares that you have mayonnaise when you need mayonnaise, guess what else he cares about? Everything. Great <laughs> Well, maybe not much. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, but you know, he cares about everything. He cares about everything in your life. And you can take it all to him. And when you do, you'll know. And the more you know, the more you see him do those things in your life, the more easily you will go, you know, this seems like a really serious problem, way worse than the lack of mayonnaise. But you know what? He cared about the mayonnaise. He cares about this. And as these things occur in your life, your priorities realign. Okay? You start to realize that your priorities about pleasing him and doing his will and hearing his voice become greater and greater. And the more that happens, the more real heaven becomes. And the more real heaven becomes, the less you care about what's going on in this earth. You're just like, no, nah, not, not a big deal. I don't care. I'm going to go to heaven anyway. You know what? So I'm just going to do this. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to trust God here and trust God there. It, it is hard. Okay? God, God, when I first came to him and was saying that hit me with a semi thing, he kind of took me up on my word, of, uh, not hit me with a semi, but things like, he told me to give away the first car I ever owned that I bought. Give it away to some pastor I didn't know. That was hard, okay? I'm back doing this to get anywhere, okay? You know, then, then after I graduated from college, and I was, I was, a, I always had many jobs and went to school full time. And after that, he said, I just want you to study and prepare and seek my face and everything like that. I don't want you to get any jobs. Well, that was, I was certain when I first heard that, that was from me. The, the devil himself, because that was completely against my nature. And he said, God said, put all your money, it was a, a few hundred dollars, in this drawer and never look in that drawer. Whenever you need to pay rent or buy groceries or anything, reach in and get money and go do what you have to do. I lived that way for months and months. And I never looked in that drawer. And money kept coming out of that drawer. I didn't, you know, not like, is the Corvette money in here? No. <laughs> Just what I needed. And God provided. And God got bigger and bigger. You know, I, I could just, you know, God's put money in this drawer. Nobody, no human being knew. And God kept providing. God kept providing. God kept doing. And then God told me to, you know, then we, Kim and I get a little money and, you know, just barely, just, just a little money. And I mean a little. I'm talking about, you know, a few hundred maybe, you know, if things are good. And God would tell us, give a thousand dollars to, we're like, what? From where? <laughs> so we gave it, and, you know, as we got it, we kept giving it, okay? And God kept testing us and like, what, what are, you, are you going to worry about the money? Or are you going to worry about doing what I said? Are you going to worry about the problem? Or are you going to trust me to deal with it? Okay. And again and again, and, and my first instinct was the panic. Every time. Okay. For anything worldly and carnal, if my instinct was the panic, it took a lot more to set her off. Okay. To, to make her like that. And, and we balanced each other out very nicely. Did I ever tell you about my daughter, that one there, the goofy one back there with the baby? 
walking out of the attic when she was like one and one and a half years old, walked out of the attic. We are up in the attic uh, and, and, you know, just, and my wife went downstairs for something and she left the attic hole. And it's one of those, just a hole and a oak and steel staircase that folds down. And she went down to get something and turned around and was coming back and my daughter, Muriel, just came sailing face down and hit the steel spring clampy things at the bottom of the oak stairs, just hit it. Kim just started screaming. Oh my God, oh my God. And I, and I heard the pooch, I heard the, you know. And I didn't even remember getting there. I just know I flew across the room and jumped down the hole and barely touched the ladder getting down there. And Muriel is face down on the carpet, writhing, not making any noise. And Kim is lost her mind. And I lay my hands on her to pray, and instantly the Spirit of God said, you're wasting your time if Kim doesn't straighten up. And, and I'm, I'm like this, okay? I'm like this, okay? and Kim's right here. And I said, either get in faith or get out of here. <laughs> and she goes, oh, I'm sorry, you're right. Praise you, Lord. We turned Muriel over. There was not a red mark on her body. There was no bruising. There was no marks. There was no nothing. There was not a rub, not a scrape, not a scratch. Nothing. I took authority. I, I, my first instinct was turn her over and see how she hurt. But I mean, I went, uh -uh, no, I'm going to pray for her wife where she is. And she's writhing and everything, and then she kind of cried a little bit, and we turned her over, and nothing. Not then, not the next day, not never. Perfect. How was she? Uh, she was not really talking. She still wore diapers, so like one and a half or one and a quarter, something like that. But she just, but um, uh, she was fearless, okay? She was, she used to climb up in the attic to see me, because that's where I studied a lot. And so we had to put a big board over the attic stairs, you know, so because to stop her from coming up. So she would come and get on her toes and get her fingertips over the top of that board and <laughs> pull herself up and come up anyway. <laughs> and the board couldn't be any bigger because I couldn't get up then. So, uh, <laughs> so but she was just uh, fearless. Uh, and um, anyway, but the, the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, uh, and, and the same thing happened when the Great Dane ripped his scalp off, pretty much. Uh, uh, Kim kind of lost it there for a minute, and I had to rebuke her, you know. In those times, in those extreme times, for some reason, they're getting to me. It's the creepy little worry about money and worry about this and everything. They, you know, and she, and she comes and helps me, okay. And that's what we have to do for each other in the body, help each other. And our, and our job to help each other is not like, oh, it's okay. I know you feel bad. <clears throat> no, it's God's still on his throne. Come on, suck it up. Praise the Lord. There's no reason to worry about this. Trust God. You know, man up, grow up, be an adult. Trust your heavenly father. Look at the things he's done in your life. And it really helps if he's done a bunch of things in your life. And if you want that, then you've got to give him opportunity. Talk to him. Invite him in. Okay? So, again, let me just share one thing I've got in here. And you may remember that the, the message to church are for all of us, as you know, and they contain praying for corrections, but throughout Revelation, the promises, it says very clearly, the promises are given to the overcomers. There's no shortcuts. You have to overcome to be an overcomer, and not just overcome once. You have to be in the habit of overcoming. In Revelation 5, 
The angel asked, who is worthy to open the book? And no one was worthy. A strong angel could not do it. Okay? But a lion, the judge, was the overcomer. And remember the reaction of John when he saw Jesus. He fell down as one dead. And you know why? He knew Jesus, right? They were buds. He knew him. He knew Jesus the Lord. He knew Jesus as the Messiah. He, you know, but he'd never seen Jesus as judge. And when he did, he fell down as one dead. Okay? God wants you to be an overcomer because we're going to see the judge. Who can be worthy? What does it require to be worthy? Humility, brokenness, repentance. There's only one ability that God requires of anybody who wants to be an overcomer. There's only one ability. If you wish to be an overcomer, you can. And there's only one ability that he requires. You know what that is? Availability. What? Availability. Just be available. Say, send me, Lord. Come to me, Lord. Teach me, Lord. Correct me, Lord. Grow me, Lord. Do you have something to say there? The lady in the plaid shirt? Yes. No, okay. Always interrupting me. <laughs> <laughs> Can I come yes, on? Uh, yes, dear. Stay right there. Well, I can reach the camera. I guess the same hand as me. Oh. Uh, we were singing this song uh, earlier, and it just put this in my mind about one of my clients who is a Christian, but he was talking about the things that are occurring in our society now, and he's like, Jesus is coming back. We're all going to just be wistful boys soon. We're going to be with him, you know, because obviously Jesus is coming back and his focus is on that. And I'm like, okay, when God calls you, you're going to go. But right now, we're here and we have a purpose for being here. And it is not a mistake that we are alive in this time. Amen. And the bride of Christ is going to wake up and be bold like the king who's coming. And we have to hold to the truth. And we have to hold fast. And we have to be bold in telling what is right from what is wrong. And we don't waver. And it just that just kind of got stirred up in me again tonight when, when we were singing. And so it kind of fit into what he was saying, which I didn't know what he was going to say. So I just wanted to deliver that to you, that you are here in this season for a purpose. And it doesn't matter your age. We are a witness of who God is and what he wants to do. Lord. And it is true, you know, these people, it seems like they're so oppressed and the, the lies and the things and the just right is wrong and you know, just everything's upside down because they're so deceived by the devil. But God loves them and he wants the, an opportunity to reach their hearts if he can reach their hearts. So we don't have to anger. Or I can be angry about what they do, but I don't hate the person who's doing it. Right. You know, I have the love of Christ for them. But at the same time, we have to hold our witness and not be afraid to say what is true. <laughs> okay, yeah. Take around the call.
thank you so much that you gave us your life, Lord. We know, Lord, that there is nothing, nothing to the human mind that is more foolish than us worshiping a man who is dead and naked hanging on a tree. But Lord, we know you did that not just to redeem us, Lord, but so that we would have to choose to believe you and receive you and see your work in our lives. Lord God, in the process of doing this, you gave up your body to be tortured for us, Lord, and you gave up your blood to redeem us. Lord, and we thank you for that. This little wafer here represents the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, the body that he willingly chose to become human into and to go out in great pain and anguish for our redemption. This is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember him, remember what he did for you, and apply it to what you need in your body because that's exactly why he did it. He didn't do it to show how tough he was. He did it so that you could be blessing and so you could reap the rewards and the benefits of it. This body was broken for you. It was sick and hurt for you. Receive now your healing through it. This is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Take and eat. And aside from the bleeding he did when he was beaten and tortured, he also bled on the cross as he died. And as this blood was shed, great redemption poured forth to all humanity on the earth. And it is through this shed blood that you come to him and through which you are redeemed. Take this juice and remember the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for you and that you are now in his family. Take and drink the blood of the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We ask you to watch over us and bless us all as we go back to our homes and everywhere we have to go. Lead us, Lord God, and guide us and help us to do your will and share your glory with everyone we come in contact with, Lord, as you lead us. In Jesus' name. We'd like you all to come forward and uh, tie a knot in the blankets that are up here tonight. There's a view. Um, and uh, just thank you for coming out. We thank Mitch and Kim and for blessing us with the presence of their children and their beautiful grandbaby. Uh, just uh, pray for continued blessings and uh, prosperity for their family. So thank you. We'll hang around for a little bit if anybody has any questions or needs prayer. And uh, we'll see you next week. And actually next Thursday night at 6 o'clock, be here or be square. Uh, because we're going to be...